This is Defenders TV Podcast, episode 234, about Jessica Jones, season 3, episode 11, a.k.a. Hellcat. Wow. <laughs> Welcome back, fellow defenders. We're here to talk about Jessica Jones, Season 3, Episode 11, a.k.a. Hellcat. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow defenders. I'm one of your other hosts, John. Yes, a.k.a. Hellcat, Episode 11 of Season 3 of Jessica Jones. Mm -hmm. It is flying by, uh, but we get to see the origins of Hellcat to some extent here. Um, Or should I say how Dorothy's... uh, previous childhood antics with her daughter patsy uh, really helps to uh, focus trisha's idea of what hellcat could be yeah yeah this might be one of our shortest episodes because it's kind of filling in the gaps around all of the things we've talked about in the previous episodes but it will be slightly different and um, definitely going to talk get into the episode in full spoiler filled detail as usual but just wanted to mention this week is san diego comic-con over in the u.s a big week for tv fans and movie fans lots of stuff going to be going on mm-hmm. but it's going to be one of the first times that we don't have any marvel netflix representation absolutely there. there's no show that's going to be coming up from the marvel netflix universe that's going to be there we're hoping that we're going to see a bit from disney plus about their future plans for the marvel tv shows uh, coming up we'll probably see some representation from agents of shield which is still ongoing at the moment uh, as we're as we speak but unfortunately yeah it feels like a bit of a weird year when you don't have some kind of panel from uh, the marvel netflix stable of shows yeah it's going to be a tough one i mean as well you know we always used to get it at new york comic-con as well mm-hmm. but uh yeah it's going to be it's going to be difficult because I suppose with all this fragmentation of services with Disney Plus, with Warner Brothers bringing their thing out, you've got HBO and their stuff, Netflix, Amazon Prime, you name it, if it's a production company or it's a studio, they're going to have a pay-for-view uh, kind of online model like Netflix. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would say uh, there will be a breaking point for most people as to what they can or cannot uh, pay for. Well, I'm laughing because month. the projection that everybody's come up, up with is, well, I'll pay for that as long as I get other services, which effectively is just going back to the cable TV model. And everybody's hoping that if they do that, then they won't have adverts. That's basically, you know, all that happened was cable TV broke down because nobody wanted to watch ads anymore. And they went to Netflix and then all of these other services spring up and somebody's going to have to bundle them all together for a nice neat price of 30 quid a month, which is basically cable TV again. So uh, really intriguing to see what happens there. But yes, we will be keeping an eye on San Diego Comic Con for things that might come into the Defenders TV podcast and TV podcast industries group of podcasts what the kind of stuff we're going to be covering in the future so definitely keep an eye out there yes this will all come from our mountain lair in the swiss alps <laughs> as we head off to zermatt oh, as yes. well for a long weekend so we will be watching it deep from inside our bunker in uh, the heartland of our territories i am so excited to go to zermatt and see that place during summertime that's going to be really good fun usually see it during winter just like it was in james bond so, <laughs> so i'm looking forward to seeing it during summertime now anyway let's get on with the actual episode uh, that we want to talk about this time um a.k.a. Hellcat, the 11th episode of the third season of Jessica Jones. Uh, this episode was written by Jane Espenson. I know Jane Espenson for years. She was one of the lead producers on Buffy the Vampire Slayer and has loads of credits all over TV shows I absolutely love. Things like Battlestar Galactica, yeah. Game of Thrones. But this is her first time on Jessica Jones. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, good stuff. Yeah, I mean, what a roll call. Buffy, gosh, it takes me back to being a spotty teenager. <laughs> Battlestar Galactica, kind of, I don't know, spotty late. year old Yeah. <laughs> late spotty 20 year old um and uh, yeah of course now game of thrones where i occasionally came out in an outburst of spots uh, <laughs> depending on whether my hair was cut or not uh, in my mid to late 30s nice nice not jane espenson's fault of course that you were in spotty for all 30 of those no. years <laughs> if zit had a name its name is john there you go <laughs> but this episode was directed by Jennifer Gatzinger. We talked about Jennifer earlier on this season because she directed episode nine of this season, uh, aka I Did Something Today. That's the episode where we had the death of Dorothy Walker, of course, so that has quite a big impact on this episode as well. Absolutely. Uh, John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for this episode? Sure. Trish Walker revisits her memories of her troubled childhood with her mum, Dorothy Walker, as she grieves for her death. As a young child, Trish is forced by Dorothy to take up acting. A series of calculated plans from Dorothy sees Trish earn a coveted leading role for a primetime sitcom. With your talent, proclaims Dorothy to Trish, you don't owe me anything. You owe the world. 
As the funeral plans take shape, Trish plots to kill Salinger, but is stopped by Jessica Jones, who tries to comfort her. Meanwhile, Jerry also blackmails Trish to help her go after Dimitri Patsiris. With Salinger now off limits, Trish aims to use her powers to stamp out evil across New York City. She approaches Eric about helping out with catching criminals, and they go after Nussbaumer. While trying to record his confession, Trish accidentally kills him in a rage. This puts Jessica in the crosshairs of the police, but also makes Eric's headaches go away. To take the pressure off Jessica, Trish and Eric plot to divert the investigators and attack Jace Montero. But an enraged Trish ends up murdering Montero. As Eric's headache recedes again and the world feels that little bit lighter, Trish is convinced killing is more effective and decides on her next target. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be around Trish when she loses control, do you? <laughs> wow, this is um, some pretty off piste Trish. Yeah, she is grieving in a pretty dangerous way, to be honest. Mm. Um, and certainly, I think this was one of the great parts about this episode were with Nussbaumer, with Jace Montero, you see Salinger in their clothes. Oh, yeah. And she just goes kind of all hellcat on them. Yes, she does. Let's get into our top five case notes for this episode. This will be slightly different. As we said, we've asked a lot of questions in the last couple of episodes, and this episode does answer a lot of the questions. To be honest, I didn't expect this to happen. I don't know why they set it up back at the early part of the season where we had episode one from Jessica's perspective, and then episode two was all from Trisha's perspective, and they've done it again here. Yeah. Um, I should have expected this to happen, but let's take a look quickly at case note number one, which is our flashback part of the season where we have a look back at it's Patsy. Uh, in our case note number one, it takes more than talent. We have our Dorothy Walker back here showing effectively Trish the ropes of how to get the coveted central role in this TV show um, called That's Our Girl, isn't it? Uh, this is the story that, that Trish was going to tell at the funeral home uh, over the body of, of Dorothy Walker when she actually changed her mind and decided to tell the story of Dorothy just wants to do everything to get everybody pushed and to use their greatest gifts effectively. Um, but we see a much more abusive Dorothy Walker here. Yeah, I mean, it certainly is encouragement to the extreme. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think you can see deep down it is about encouragement and making her stand out. Mm -hmm. But there's just those few little things where she admonishes her verbally it's not just physical yeah. you know she pinches her um and she she does a few physical uh bits of um how shall i say persuasion or abuse with her but it's also um the maybe the more mental side of things i mean there yeah. is a great moment where after all of this um, plotting and planning and hustling by by Dorothy, you know, Patsy does get her moment, and, and she's going to become Vicky on this prime time sitcom. Uh, and Patsy or Trish is there going? I didn't think it was going to be this big or this much work. You know, uh, absolutely, Dorothy is treating her as an adult here. Mm -hmm. you know, she goes, "You must show." The, the other actors that if, if they're dropping out, if they're not performing, you need to step in here. You need to do this. It is encouragement uh, above and beyond what is probably um, required. Nonetheless, I suspect there's a lot of uh, young child prodigies that have that push uh, coming from uh, from their parents. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a little interesting to see this, but I do like how... You know, it, it's all about trying to do things differently. I like the hustle from Dorothy and Trish here, you know, from the ginger hair wearing to, to what does she say? Um, there's nothing better than the director seeing their own reflection in mm -hmm. the person that is playing the, the lead. Uh, you have this ginger hair. Um, you have the delivery of the lines, that opening scene where she kind of delivers them as you would kind of expect. And Dorothy is like, no, 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 no. You're going to have like 20 other uh, actors doing exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Do it differently. You have the star six, nine uh, to uh, step in and, and give that helping hand, you know, to show, look, I can do this. I can stand in for the lead actress who, who's playing Vicky and ultimately lands that, that job. So I, I think this is really, really interesting. It, you, it shows the abuse. It shows where that's coming from as well, which I think is really important. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's really interesting, though, and an interesting idea. I love that moment as 
Uh, they both walk into the audition for the first time and you have Dorothy looking at this sea of girls, all kind of similar age group. There's one girl who looks about 16 and very tall, but everybody is blonde and everybody looks exactly the same. And she just goes, this looks like an invasion. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. Or an infestation. An infestation. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's like, it's like children of the court, effectively. So doing something really different to make Patsy stand out is really important. And all of the advice she's giving, or a lot of the advice anyway, is really important for someone that wants to get into acting to do. But I just think it's quite interesting seeing the reaction from uh, from Patsy herself when she's sitting around the table after the table read and Dorothy realizes that they're about to give her the role and she starts to celebrate and is just her hand is grabbed put back under the table and she is told yeah. act like an adult yeah. by by Dorothy it's really interesting but I suppose some of the cracks that you see behind what's going on you see that Dorothy sold everything to put it into the career of her daughter could be a good thing of course because support from your parents is really really important but she's effectively saying to her, we're going to be out in the streets if you don't work hard. Yeah, she's yeah. only 10 years old or 11 years old here, but she has the pressure of holding their family together and paying for everything because of her mother's sacrifices. It's really interesting. The British Grand Prix, Prix is on at the moment. We saw an interview with Lewis Hamilton's father uh, the other day yeah. where he was talking about all the sacrifices he made to effectively allow Lewis Hamilton to live his dream and become this world champion of you know, eternal renown, I suppose. He will always be remembered associated with Formula One now for, because of everything his father did to get him there. You know, you have people like that that are really supportive of their kids and will do anything for them. I'm sure they had tough times. I'm sure there were times when uh, things things may have gone across lines. But what we see here is with Dorothy, she is pushing this child into a situation where she doesn't really want to go. When she finds out that what she's responsible to do because she's now the star of the show, you hear... Patsy going, I didn't think it was that. I just wanted to be an actress. I just wanted to act in a TV show. And Dorothy saying to her, but it is hard. That's what happens when yeah. you get into this business. You know, yeah. I, li- I like the I like the storyline that we've gotten here. We've always known that Dorothy pushes her kids. And we've, we've seen Trish talk about it in a good way before. And we've seen Jessica talk about it in a bad way before. But I like how they've represented this on screen. Yeah, I, I think it's a really nice flashback or memory of Trish, Patsy, sort of building up to this sort of big break that she gets and the role of her mom who is is pushing her and Mm -hmm. as you say it's that fine line where she can you know you you move into um a uncompromising uh manipulating position of of dorothy here yeah it's it's no longer about patsy it's about her and what she wants patsy to do yeah that's the difference um, you know, it, it, if if we take the the Lewis Hamilton thing again, you know, his his dad said a really interesting thing, which he said, if you don't go to school and if you don't study hard at school, you won't go to karting at the weekend. Yeah. Whereas this is kind of like Dorothy will give up the school in order to push Patsy absolutely in this direction, and mm-hmm. um, whether Patsy wants it or not, it is Dorothy living out her dreams exactly. uh, through. Her, her her daughter mm-hmm. um and i i like the way though that dorothy is manipulative here not just with patsy but also with the showrunners mm-hmm. you know as we've mentioned about the ginger hair uh you know she she has these little tricks as i say it, to me it just feels like a hustler she's she she does these tricks to jump the queue to get kind of a he- at the head of the queue to go in and have the next audition Mm -hmm. uh, to get a supporting role. And then again, the opportunity to read the lines of the lead role of Vicky and then is taken by uh, Dorothy. You know, she pushes Patsy to do it, but is taken by Dorothy so that then Trish can make that impression at the read through in Mm -hmm. the absence of, of the the lead actress who is off sick or something. She's recovering from chickenpox, isn't she? Yeah, I think it's really nice, and I think it's really important within the scheme of this episode where you have this interwoven stories of Jessica Jones and Trish just after Dorothy's murder, but also the the way that these memories in this grieving process Mm -hmm. that that Trish is having um, is pushing her towards a certain outlook that Hellcat will have, ultimately, which is uncompromising i owe the world you yeah. know I, I owe the world to be the best i can be at hellcat and to be this uncompromising 
version of a hero that just takes down bad guys. Yeah, yeah. And and you're right, the the moments that you kind of realise that Dorothy's manipulating everything around to her way as well is you see Dorothy manipulating the showrunner into naming the show It's Patsy, effectively. And that's what we've always known the show as. I was wondering, was it That's Our Girl was the first show she was on and then there was a spin-off to it was It's Patsy. I thought Patsy was the name of the character that, that Trish played. Of course, her full name is Patricia and it's just shortened by her mother to Patsy. But I had just assumed that this was all to do with the disrespect of Dorothy effectively calling her child after the biggest character she ever played. But of course it's not. It's just a different shortening of her name that Trish doesn't really like much anymore, you know? Yeah. Um, but I do like the, the idea that uh, everything that's going on here in the past manipulated by Dorothy pushes Trish down this road that Trish really didn't want to go down. But she looks back on it now as a superpowered person who got her superpowers in the way, she, the way that she did. And the words from her mother that she has to give back to the world do push her in that direction to go out and be a superhero in her own way. But let's get on to case note number two. As we said, slightly different to normal. This is kind of answering the question that we had a couple of episodes ago, which was, did Trish kill Salinger and why didn't she kill him? Yeah, exactly. It, it's really interesting that we see, you know, the the, the first time where just after uh, she comes across her mum's uh, body and she goes after Salinger, that, um, you know, She's thwarted in many respects from killing Salinger because he was prepared. He was actually waiting for Jessica Jones. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there's a nice little moment where he is surprised that she can see in the dark because of her little kitty powers Mm -hmm. of of being able to see in the dark. Um, But ultimately, um, she is thwarted then by Jessica because she is able to arrive in time to stop her from effectively slitting his throat. Yeah. Um, it's, again, a great little uh, scene. You see the, the martial arts skills that Trish has obtained. Mm-hmm. You see her do the scratch on Salinger's face. Yeah. So y- you have this moment where then, you know, Trish effectively is forced to back off because Salinger is in police custody at the hospital, but also Jessica um, telling her to lay low. So Salinger has almost taken off the menu a bit for this kissy cat um, for for the time being, but certainly um, the moment where she's in the hospital and she goes to visit him is really, really good, I thought. Yeah, that is really good, definitely. After seeing that fight with Salinger in his apartment, I definitely wouldn't be calling those kitty cat powers, John, if you were to talk to uh, talk to Rachel Taylor, who plays the character, or to Trish Walker, calling them kitty cat powers might get you uh, smashed on the floor. <laughs> I love that moment when you have Salinger behind her and she just flips him over on his back, cracking him on the floor. It's a really cool move that she does before taking his knife off him and, and putting it on his throat. Never eat in Salinger's house. That's a kitchen knife that he's used <laughs> to kill about three people, I think, at this stage. <laughs> yeah. That's really weird. It's like, um, can I chop up some vegetables? Don't use the middle knife. Don't use the middle knife. (laughs) Really, really creepy. Also creepy was that moment of confrontation while Salinger's lying in the hospital bed. I I thought this was really nicely done. Something I wasn't expecting. You know, again, it's great having this... Uh, episode from Trisha's perspective because mm-hmm. obviously we didn't see any of this um, when Jessica Jones was there. You actually just assumed that Trish was grieving for Dorothy yeah. kind of cooped up in that sort of really cheap hostel uh, and hotel just waiting for Jessica to help. You really got the sense from that episode previously that Jessica was the one who was solid as a rock, mm-hmm. in control, at least giving that pretense so that Trish didn't crumble. And in the end, what you see is that Trish is absolutely channeling her, her grief into uh, violent pro action in a sense. And part of that is paying that visit to Salinger in hospital where, you know, she threatens him again. She says, I don't care about going to prison. Yeah. And you have Salinger saying, well, but what about getting a bullet in the head? You know, you did take down two of their cops outside the front of my apartment. Mm. Um, I, I think Salinger is great. I, I love how um, he is just whispering it all under his breath because he's allowed 
um, Trish to come in. There's Mm -hmm. still the police guard outside the front. He knows he's safe at this present moment in time, but he's whispering everything he's done to her, and his eyes are darting constantly to to that door. It is a great bit of acting. I thought that was really uh, top notch. Just those little details, yeah. uh, but ultimately, you know, with Trish pushing him, uh, we we hear that you know he has done his trophy as well. He yeah. has done this um, photograph of. Dorothy in those last moments of her life. Yeah. Um, and uh, he tells Trish this, pushing her. Yeah, it, it definitely felt like something out of uh, one of those serial killer shows like Dexter or like Hannibal, where we talked about it before, where Jessica and Trish were sent off around the city effectively on this um, fool's errand to try and find this victim that Salinger was going to kill. And the victim actually turned out to be Dorothy. But it's, as I say, it feels like one of those serial killer shows where he wanted to make sure they're away for a specific amount of time so that he could set up this murder exactly the way he would set up all the other ones and have enough time to carry it out as well. You know, you don't want to have Trish knocking on the door to go and visit her mom when it's going on. So you send them off around the city. It's a really interesting plot that's gone on there. Um, I'm kind of glad that they did keep this in here. Not for the characters, obviously, but I'm glad they kept in that he didn't just murder her mother. He wanted a photograph just like he did with all of his other victims, because that's his modus operandi. That's his, yeah. that's what he does as a serial killer. Um, I love that discussion between Salinger and Trish, where uh, Salinger saying to her, you just get off on killing. Um, and she, she says, no, that's you. You get power out of killing the people that you do. And he says, well, no, it's not that. That's just a byproduct of the photographs I take, you know revealing that he's taken this photograph of Dorothy and it's waiting for Trish to find at some opportune moment in future. Yeah, that that was a weird moment. I, I felt it was a weird uh, rationalisation of what he does or the distinction between uh, what he does. But uh, compared to Trish, I suppose, or compared to his view of Jessica Jones, that, you know, he, the deaths are a byproduct of his work. Well, yeah. no, it's still murder. But I suppose, ultimately, he is, you know, a high IQ deranged psychopath. Mm-hmm. So, yes, he does rationalize it in a different way. And um, because that's how he is go and um, why he rationalizes going after the superheroes, mm-hmm. because they think they're better than everyone else. And he's saying, no, you can be normal and as good if not better than the superheroes yeah yeah i think we're we're missing that that big moment where he reveals the full details behind what he's doing in these photographs he's had these discussions a few times we've seen them in the past but it is that idea i think anyway that he's looking for the the realization on a person's face that they're in their final moments and they could have done something better in their life that's what he presents to them effectively they could have done something better with their life if they hadn't gone down the path they'd gone down to end up in this situation and it feels like he has to then follow it up with a murder of them because it can't be they have this epiphany about what they could have done it's not like in saw where they have the epiphany about what they could have done and then save themselves it is you have the epiphany you realize you're going to die and then you die is the way that he rationalizes yeah. it in his head and he captures the final moment. It can't be the final moment and then they walk away. So it needs to be the final moment uh, effectively. So it's it's interesting. We just I just feel like we need that one more scene maybe in the future. I'm sure we're going to get it before Salinger goes. We're going to get that moment where he gives a bit more detail behind what it is he's actually trying to capture in these photographs. Yeah, I mean, I think before we move on to case note three, I think the other element of this is, um, you know, Trish in the apartment finding this photo I found really heartbreaking yeah. I thought it was really really nicely played you know it, it ties into that moment where she comes back to her mother's apartment which you do see in the Jessica episode of this and mm-hmm. um, but you then delve in more where she's flipping through the photo albums uh, that they have and yeah. just that moment where she sees it I thought was really uh, heartbreaking really nicely played actually absolutely absolutely yeah but on to case note number three, because, yeah, we did have a number of questions. And this third one is, <laughs> how did Eric and Trish uh, team up? Yes. Um, well, it certainly started with a punch, really. Uh-huh. Uh, it, it's certainly taking it from the Jessica Jones version of the storyline, where she comes back to the hotel, bringing Eric, saying, you don't know how much he did for you in, in the last few hours. But slowly from that, her and Eric begin to, to team up, uh, because... 
Trish sees the potential with what Eric has. She can find these bad people yeah. that she wants to bring to task. She wants to bring to justice. Yeah, she has um, a moment where she meets the doorman outside of her apartment after finding this photograph of Dorothy, and the doorman says one of those massively inspirational type of things, yeah. Profound and prophetic. Yeah, it's, it seems a little weird and out of place, yeah. I thought. Um, it's something about forces of darkness, good people standing idly by, devil wins. So it's not kind of your average conversation that, that you have. Yeah. Um, I think the full text is the devil wins if good people stand idly by. But, like, it's just, yeah, it, it was like, wow, Omar, are you reading for sort of... Uh, religion or something mm. in in university it was kind of it just felt completely out of kilter but nonetheless it was prophetic enough maybe profound enough in that moment for trish having seen this photograph of her mum's last few yeah. minutes uh, or seconds uh, that she goes to eric to to get um, his skills on board, effectively a team up I- I- in shorthand mm-hmm. uh, between these two, uh, and it really um, is kind of quite interesting. And and you hear Nussbaum uh, brought up again this 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 corrupt cop, um, and Eric gives Trish this file on Nussbaum to go after him to get record his confession, and that's what it all starts out as to record the confession of Nussbaum. Yeah. Um, but it ends up in a far worse place because of the rage that is in this Hellcat. Yeah, I love this idea where they're trying to get his confession and she's standing in front of him reading off all of the names of each of the children that he's murdered, each of these kids. I think one of them is about 21, is about the oldest of the kids. Um, but he's defending himself going, oh, well, they're all bad people kind of thing. I also like that discussion between Eric and Trish as well, where where Eric tells Trish he's killing drug dealers, and she goes, but they're bad people. That's exactly what she's doing, effectively, is trying to kill bad people and take them out of the world. Um, but that's the way it goes, effectively. Trish is going to go and end off killing yeah. the spammer, mistakenly. But we have this reveal that there's another side of Eric's power that we didn't know, and he didn't know in the past, because he's never actually achieved what Trish achieves here, I suppose. Um, as... No spammer dies on the ground, we see Eric laughing and realizing the world's a lighter, brighter place. So unlike yeah, yeah. all of the other superheroes in the Marvel and the DC universes, I think what we were talking about after watching the episode, one of the interesting things we see here is the power of Eric is to identify actually bad people, and he can put them on a spectrum as well. He could be in a room of ten really bad people and find the worst person yeah. in the room. And if that person dies, the world becomes brighter in his mind. Everything gets lifted and everything's better and he can detect that as well. So that's really interesting. The decision of all of the superheroes to not kill the bad guys actually goes against Eric's superpower. Yeah, it it is that death does make things better for the world. Mm. It brightens it, it lightens it, it makes it feel a better place, I think is what he says. And I think, you know, Trish doesn't really fully know the implications of this for herself until... uh, Jace Montero, which we'll come to a bit later in in, in the podcast. But, Absolutely. But certainly, um, this is a really interesting moment for Eric's character. Yeah, and definitely one thing to point out here, we know that Trish didn't actually murder Nussbaumer. She kicked him and it was an accidental death. She wasn't trying to even see that moment when she's checking to make sure he's okay after he smacks off the pole that killed him effectively. So it's not a premeditated murder as such. It is an accidental death in the first instance uh, anyway, or it seems like it in this this first time. We'll get on to the other death later on uh, after our next point. Yeah, it's probably something like aggravated manslaughter yeah. because... Ultimately, she did go to provoke him, she, and, yeah, and whilst was acci- him. yeah, and whilst accidental, um, there was a lot of stuff that happened beforehand. You know, she was beating him mm-hmm. pretty fiercely because you have that moment where it's Salinger in the police uniform. So I, I like that he's popping there yeah. into her head, uh, into her thoughts, uh, and clouding her judgment here. Yeah, yeah, you know. And one of the other questions that we had, taking us on to case note number four, one of the questions that we had was how's Hogarth involved in all of this because we saw her trying to get a meeting with Trish over the last episode trying to get that moment where she'll have Trish in the office and tell her that she knows what's happening in this case we see her turning up at Trish's apartment with that photo of Trish dressed as the masked vigilante telling her I know exactly who you are it's interesting again looking back on the previous episodes and seeing the conversation that Hogarth was having effectively saying I know someone that can sort this but Sarah's situation out when she's talking to Kith she has the skills I need to sort out 
the Spitzera situation is what she said to Kith. She was talking about Trish, talking about going to Trish and needing Trish to use her skills to do what she does best effectively. Uh, the way Hogarth describes it is, you stole from me in the past, now I need you to go after a bad guy, which is what you do anyway, and go and steal from him for me effectively, and then I'll delete all of the footage that I have on you. Yeah, I need your gifts to go after Dimitri. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly, I really like that Hogarth's blackmail, her threat to Trish is countered by Trish with another threat. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a great moment where they're just kind of lined up, uh, where she goes, remember... I go after bad people as well, implying Jerry Hogarth is a bad person yeah. and I will come after you if you carry on like this. Or maybe she will go after her anyway. Yeah, Who absolutely. knows? I think that's really throwing something interesting into the mix here of, of this relationship mm-hmm. because, um, again, right at the end of this uh, episode, you know, Trish goes, I know who to go after next. Is this Dimitri yeah. or is it Salinger, given that with Jace Montero, she sees Salinger again? Or is uh, it Hogarth? Or is it indeed Hogarth? Yeah, because, um, you know, she needs to now neutralize this threat. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's all she sees. I mean, because it is a tense meeting. You know, she has Jerry up on the post with her kind of foot under her neck. Yeah. yeah. Um, Fair adieu to Rachel Taylor for that move. It's That's awesome. I love that moment where she's got her foot right against her, her throat, effectively telling her, I've got this power, I could kill you right now. And then this information goes nowhere, does it? You yeah, know, it feels like really Bruce Lee. Um, yeah. It looks really good, Very absolutely. Good. Very um, good. I can do that move as well. I definitely can't do that move. But at least we know how Jerry Hogarth is involved now. You know, we don't have to question that anymore. We see it. She's got the information. She has the video. She's got it on her touchscreen uh, computer where she's able to just drag it and show the exact face up on screen, knowing that it is definitely Trish. And effectively, she's just going to use her for this deal. But with Jerry, though, do you think she'll um, delete this footage that she has once Trish has dealt with Petsaris? Or do you think she might keep it in case she possibly needs a masked vigilante in the future? It depends how long she needs it for. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder how long Jerry Hogarth has left in this world, whether it's through her medical condition or whether it's through the wrath of Hellcat, a.k.a. Trish Walker. And I'm I'm kind of wondering, will she get Eric to kind of give a assessment of Jerry Hogarth maybe. ultimately on his spectrum? Yeah, yeah, maybe. I, I do think that Trish knows, even without the powers of Eric, how bad a person Hogarth is, though she's dealt with her a lot over the years. <laughs> That's true, but do you know it, it would yeah. be interesting if Eric gave his independent assessment, mm-hmm. I think. <laughs> <laughs> a four point uh, file dropped on her table of, of how bad Jerry Hogarth really yeah, is. Exactly. Uh, let's get on to our final case note um how was jessica arrested we had a bit of a question uh, about that wonderful scene that was going on where we had jessica standing outside trisha's apartment for a full day basically for a number of hours overnight anyway uh, and we thought she stood there for a while waiting for trish to move and then the police came along and, and grabbed her and took her away what actually has happened is that trish was told to stay indoors by eric because they knew the cops could be following her and she was told to wait for the daytime so that they could see the cops coming. And when they go out to carry out this um, beating of Jace Montaro to give Jessica an alibi so that she can get away from the police, it turns out that Jessica's following Trish. So Eric calls in the cops on her. Um, and yeah. she's following her quite far down the street. It looked in the last episode like it was almost directly outside Trish's apartment she was arrested. But there was actually quite a bit of time that... that Jessica had been following Trish before Eric gets there and calls the cops. Yeah, I was really shocked by this. I mm. was not expecting that um, Eric would call the police. And, and my initial impression was like, oh, the, you know, the double crossing uh, so-and-so. Uh, we probably need uh, Luke Cage's swear jar for, for me to really say what I thought. But um, <laughs> certainly I thought, oh, wow, he's double crossed her. And then, of course, you, you realize that he needs to get her in custody because what they're about to do next is to throw um, the investigation that is happening with the police so that Jessica is in a known location when they go after Jace Montero yeah. and link that to the Nussbaumer uh, murder. Exactly, yeah. But of course, like, what better place for Jessica to be than in the custody of the cops as an alibi? You know, they're, they're, it's the perfect place. You know, if this happens again, if there's another beating up of another person by this masked vigilante and Jessica's in with the cops, then, you know, she's perfectly safe. They do seem to have a bit of a vendetta against Jessica Jones. They seem to want to pin it on her from the beginning. You know, I think it's partly because they 
they all feel that the previous detective, Detective Costa, was working for Jessica almost, that that's what got him fired. And they seem to want to blame her for getting that cop kicked off the force and the death of no spammer. So uh, I'm intrigued to see what goes on before they find out about Jace Montero, what will happen to Jessica when she's in prison with these cops. You know, it's quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's a shame Costa's not there, but certainly the, the Costa element seems to be uh, the driver behind this. And I, I, I think, again, you know, you can see Eric's motivation now for calling the cops. It's not a, a double cross. It is to get her, you know, on the right part of the chessboard whilst they go after Jace uh, Montero. Mm-hmm. And of course, as they do, uh, we have this moment where again, Trish loses it. She sees Salinger. She has also been attacked by, by Jace uh, Montero as well with, with different uh, metal implements and so on so she yeah, is like having a baseball to, bat first yeah baseball then, bat and then some kind of like architects kind of steel ruler or something that's, like that the, a massive spanner as well yeah like or it. something like that uh, so like she really is having to defend herself mm. but at the end of the day um she gets carried away uh with her punching and it's that moment where Eric feels the world getting better kind of once again and you see the realization that for Trish Eric's power is perfect because it justifies what she is doing. Exactly. That actually killing people deals with an evil world because it gets lighter, it gets brighter, it gets more angelic, it feels <laughs> better. And her metric is Eric. And so this is just feeding her with um, how she is justified to do that. But also she has this power. She has developed this power through her training with the parkour and the martial arts with the trainer. Mm-hmm. And now... Krav Maga, yeah. Yeah, with the Krav Maga. And now, you know, it comes back to her mom, her deceased, murdered mother, Dorothy, where it is, you know, you owe the world for this talent that you have mm. and which you have worked for, which is exactly the same as with her um, younger self as she's pushed towards um the the acting role yeah this time she is being dorothy on herself almost yeah yeah yeah. she she needs that push from her mother from beyond the grave effectively to take this on as being her new calling i suppose um it's kind of interesting we have a little bit of detail behind jace montero as well he's a businessman who's been burning down buildings across the city so that he can get the rights to build whatever he wants on top of those uh, derelict buildings in the past we hear eric describing the kind of people that have died in the fires there's families that were there there's some squatters that have died in some of the buildings there's even a fireman that's been killed and this guy's completely unapologetic about it and is in fact planning to do it all over again so uh, it's that moment when Trish realizes that he's killed 14 people. I think Eric said 12, and then she realizes actually a few more that didn't even show up in all of the investigations that Eric did. And she goes, this guy's even worse than Nussbaumer. He's killed even more people. Yeah. So the world would be a much better place if he goes. Um, it's also interesting, and you say she's used Eric to find these two criminals in the past, but now she's going to go and listen to her own thoughts, effectively. She says, I know exactly who I'm going to go after next. I think that means Salinger. I think it's it's most likely going to be Salinger that's going to go after in the next episode. Yeah. Because there's only one person in the entire sphere of Trish that could be worse than Jace Montaro, and that's the serial killer that got away with murder. Um, or she allowed to get away with murder, I suppose. So she doesn't need Eric's vibe senses i suppose to go and find out about this guy she's gonna go and do it herself without any kind of help from eric so i think that's the collision course they're going to be on in the penultimate episode of jessica jones definitely yeah and with jessica as well Potentially, but again, jessica's in with the police at the moment so what's she going to be able to do about this we'll see next episode a couple of notes Going on? Yeah, um, Whiskey Watch goes to the world of Eric's apartment. Uh, mm-hmm. We see him having a few swigs when uh, Trish is there. Presumably a little bit of uh, nerve calming going on there. Yeah. Uh, he does try to get a second glass in uh, short succession, but uh, is prevented by uh, Trish. Yeah. Didn't catch the brand, but uh, certainly 
uh, whiskey is consumed at uh, many times of yes. uh, the the day here. I do love that moment when Trish arrives at his apartment and goes, "It's seven p.m. Are you just getting up?" And he responds with, "I'm a night owl." Okay, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great. Exactly. Moment that she she says yourself and Jessica are perfectly matched. So uh, so we know she knows uh, her sister very well as well. So uh, really good fun. Um, I just wanted to point out there is a kid sitting beside Trish at her table read called Derek, spelled correctly as well. So I'm in the Marvel universe. <laughs> 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 yes, you are. <laughs> I liked it. It's a flashback too, and the kids probably around the same age as I would have been back when Trish was that age. So yeah, it's, oh, look it's at you trying me. to justify. It's maybe me. <laughs> um, we do hear the full "It's Patsy" theme tune in this episode as well. I hope your Netflix didn't make you skip the credits and miss out on this wonderful full rendition of "It's Patsy." It's really good. Yeah, I Absolutely. know. I know. We've heard Rachel Taylor sing it at a karaoke for a kid's birthday party to get information back at the start of season two, wasn't it? Where she was, she was at the kid's birthday party yeah. and they made her sing it uh, to the crowd that were there. But I think this is the first time we've heard the full theme tune uh, on this show. I love when they give these insipid tunes to us that just stay in our head. I've been singing It's Patsy for about three hours now. Yeah, really, <laughs> really good. Absolutely. Yes, so with that theme song in your head, Derek, do you defend Jessica Jones? Season 3, episode 11, a.k.a. Hellcat. It's Patsy, Patsy. Yeah, yes, I do. I definitely defend this episode of Jessica Jones. It's an interesting one. As you say, this actually feels like it could have just been split differently across the previous two episodes. They could have added these scenes into uh, the, each of the episodes and given, given us the answers for the questions that we had at the time. Um, but that doesn't make it dramatically interesting to do it that way you know yeah um, this makes it dramatically interesting to come back and revisit the situations that we've seen before from the perspective of trish walker dealing with the death of her mother it was interesting listening back as i was i was doing the edit for our podcast on episode 10 and it was interesting going back on it and hearing you guys and myself talk about um that Trish didn't seem to be as affected as Jessica was, but that's because we were seeing it from Jessica's perspective. Obviously, that whole episode was how Jessica deals with the loss of a woman that she didn't really like, whereas this episode is much more about Trish taking inspiration from a woman that she did like, even though she had some major problems with her in her past. Yeah. And we see that, effectively, the reason she's becoming Hellcat is because she's actually listening to her mother's inspirational speech telling her she must give back to the world for the gift that she's gotten. I still wonder, and it's not been answered yet, I still wonder if this work that was done to give Trish superpowers has changed her perception of the world and given her this aggressive streak. Uh, Without a shadow of a doubt. That's what I, it feels I, I, like, yeah, isn't it? absolutely. It feels like anybody else with these powers in the Marvel Universe wouldn't be killing people. She's killed two people in this episode, effectively, and is now justifying that she's able to go out and kill somebody else. So it feels like potentially the actual procedure that was done on her to give her these powers has caused a little snap in her brain that we haven't uh, that that we haven't really talked about in the show yet. Well, and it, it's like she's got the taste for it. Yeah. Um, you know, she's done Jessica's mum. Now she's got these two under her belt, you know. Um, so certainly, she, is she turning into Salinger? I know, and she's got Eric right beside her going, and the world's becoming a brighter place Yay. with every kill you've had. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, definitely a good episode of Jessica Jones. I'm loving this series. And only two more episodes to go. I'm really looking forward to seeing episode 12 and 13. John, do you defend this episode of Jessica Jones, season three, episode 11, a.k.a. Hellcat? I do. I give it four night owls out of five. Oh. Uh, I really liked how this interwove the stories of Jessica Jones and Trish here, mm -hmm. looking at it from the different perspective. I, I really like this technique of, of doing it because it, it does, it opens up those same moments from a different perspective. And I think it's really, really nice. And I think coupled with the post Dorothy murder flashback, uh, you know, for me, I'm kind of the way I, I've, I've kind of in, taken that and interpreted it is that you know in her grief she's still trying to uh, hold on to the bedrock that is dorothy her mom uh, that main influence in her life and how she should cope with this grief that she's now dealing with mm -hmm. and it's pushing her towards this really extreme uh, idea of being hellcat who kills and makes the world a better place um it would be interesting if she kills again to, for, for absolute sure. And that's why who she after next? Yes, Salinger is the obvious one. But it would be interesting if, you know, for Dimitri, it is simply that she goes after him just to get the, the, the records that 
Jerry needs, but ends up killing him right. and then moves on to Salinger. I would almost like to see that because it would show her kind of going down this tunnel um, even further. Yeah. You know, she doesn't need to kill Dimitri, but maybe in doing her investigation with Eric, Eric goes, well, this guy is a really nasty piece of work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she can't leave any stone unturned in a sense. It'd be very difficult to prove that she murdered three people by mistake. Oops, sorry. No, no, exactly. But but that's the thing. It's still, is it a mistake of what Trish is doing Mm. or is it not? And I think if she goes after Salinger, absolutely that isn't the case. Mm -hmm. But was it beforehand? You can, you can, understand that in terms of her vengeance because he murdered her mom and took that photograph so i I really like how um you know trish is anchored with dorothy here Uh, and yes dorothy is almost acting beyond the grave in, in the same way that she pushed trish to um to be this actress and trish is pushing herself through the memories of Dorothy doing that to her, mm-hmm. uh, to to be this uh, new person with these talents, uh, and she doesn't want to let them go to waste because she owes the world uh, with ha- the the benefit of having this talent. Uh, so I, I thought this was really really good, absolutely. So I do defend this episode. Excellent, excellent. Let's get on to some feedback from Facebook. Uh, Bob Phillips says, says, So, Chris Jones and John Harrison were both right. Hello Kitty Punisher is working with Eric and for Jerry to clean up the streets and perform weird romantic thievery (laughs) and lose her cool too. (laughs) The Eric Helix, not happy with the idea of execution being an okay thing and making his badness in the world monitor reduce... And Dorothy, oh Dorothy, I am sure I wouldn't have wanted to be your friend if I knew what you were like. All that horrible emotional abuse of little Patsy. Just imagine she was a skanky crime mother like Pool Granny instead of a stage mom. And how would she be judged? That's an interesting point. I didn't even think about the granny earlier on in the season who'd loaned Eric loads of money and then was effectively having him beaten up and almost killed in front of her grandson, who was also practicing this idea of throwing a guy into uh, into the pool with stones on them effectively so that influential side of the elderly parental person in your life and that's the kind of thing that Dorothy is like you know if she yeah, was absolutely. a crime mother and not a stage mom yes she'd be judged very differently and and it, it you know the abuse is more emotional it's more psychological mm-hmm. uh you know her, her her physical stuff is maybe the the pinch or yeah. the slap or, or something like that she's not beating Patsy yeah. but she is pummeling her emotionally exactly uh, here so yeah uh, good good shout out the uh Bob for yeah, sure thanks, Bob. Uh, some more feedback through from Tina Brown. I am about to give season three the highest compliment in my power. It has forced me to go back and rewatch season two and appreciate it much more than I did. I also have rewatched parts of season one, which is still my favorite. Kudos to Melissa Rosenberg. Trisha's story arc was there from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really. Uh, I think it's really good, Tina, actually. I, I, I've i kind of, you know, the connection back to season two, for me, has kind of elevated season two a bit, certainly earlier on with the, the fallout between Trish and Jessica over yeah. uh, Trish murdering her mum. And, of course, yes, season one, this idea that, you know, Trish really wants to be like Jessica. Um, she wants to kind of be that saviour, that helper, that superhero. Uh, it's a really good... Uh, kind of resolution here in season three for sure tying up bits of season one and season two yeah yeah definitely really enjoying season three so far and i know season two we all had little issues with it and issues here and there there was some great stuff in season two as well it's difficult when you've got an entire show with 13 episodes to just give a rating and say good not good you know there's so much in that season that i really did enjoy even though it did get a little bit circuitous towards the end of the season talking about the same idea uh, a bit too much towards the end but there's definitely some great stuff that they've pulled out for this season and uh, to continue on the arc of jessica and trish Uh, thanks so much for your feedback there yeah thanks tina Uh, again thank you so much fellow defenders for joining us Uh, it's coming up to the last two episodes of uh, jessica jones Mm -hmm. on defenders tv podcast so please send your thoughts comments and discussion points through to feedback at defenders tv podcast.com on our email we have our facebook group as well so you can share everything on our spoiler filled uh, spoiler comments 
just go over to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash defenders tv podcasts yeah. and of course please um share reviewers raters over on any good or evil drunk or sober podcast catcher of your choice share the love by sharing the podcast yes thanks so much to everybody that's been doing that over the last uh 234 episodes um, amazing to think that we've done this many episodes of Defenders TV Podcast as John mentioned we've only got two episodes of Jessica Jones coming up if you want to share any thoughts about Defenders TV Podcast as a whole as we're coming up to our final episode of this show uh, overall let us know of your thoughts of any of the shows that we've covered uh, on Defenders TV Podcast let us know email us at the email address that John mentioned yeah and of course voicemail fellow Defenders uh, over on tvpodcastindustries.com or DefendersTVPodcast.com yeah. uh, please leave up to 90 90 seconds of your thoughts over on voicemail would be great to get your your voices uh, pitter patter on the final two episodes yes love to hear from you thanks so much for joining us for this episode we'll be back with our review of Jessica Jones season 3 episode 12 aka a lot of worms it's really soon later on this week as always fellow defenders it is a pleasure speaking with you uh, I want to go and get my beef brisket uh, certainly not my sea biscuit I don't really like horses nay 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 (laughs) but after i've had a good wallop of beef stew uh, we'll be back to speak with you again bye bye